Somebody else say it does need it. I'll put it in again. <laughs> Let's check again. We go to the left here, AC, and we go down diagonally. So AACA. We're going to have to get CB, and I don't see CB. No, so it is OK as it stands. Where did you think we could get it? 1, 1. Oh, but we're not going up there. For this guy, we just go straight left. 1, 1, and 2, 3 would, would not generate 2, 4. Right, right, okay. So we're OK. Right. <laughs> And the thing that we were doing humanly, not going on when we, all we needed was a B, would that be any economy in our program? I don't know. Um, uh, that's really an engineering kind of question because you don't want to spend too much time just checking for that either, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wouldn't take too much of a check to see whether you've gotten them all. But I think in big grammars, you don't usually get them all. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I better not guess. I don't know. I haven't done experiments to see whether, whether this parsing algorithm would speed up in real time, you know, noticeably, if you put those uh, extra checks in. But at the same time, nobody does because nobody uses this. I mean, everybody's got, there's this, these better linear time algorithms, so I don't think anybody's spending any time trying to optimize the CYK algorithm. Uh, you but, can do it in linear time? Yes, you can do parsing in linear time. Only with, o only with, with these LRK grammars, not in this general case. But nobody works with grammars in the general case. But with LRK grammars, you can definitely get it down to linear time. There's a very nice paper that first describes, I think, the first linear time algorithm. Actually, it might be n squared. I don't know if it was linear time in the first version of this paper. But, but I think in 1970, uh, there's an algorithm by a guy named Early. I think that's how you spell his name, either with an E at the end or not. I'm not sure. Uh, Early's algorithm, which describes a parsing that takes linear time for deterministic context-free languages. And it's in the communications of the ACM in 1970. It's reprinted. There's one communications of the ACM, I think, around 1980 or 1990 at the turn of the decade, which prints like all the, you know, the greatest hits of the ACM papers, including like, it, you know, the Unix operating system, Ethernet, uh, uh, Early's parsing algorithm, uh, COD's paper on relational databases, all like the the seminal papers, and uh, and that's one of them. And you can look it up. It was reprinted. Hmm. Like you can look at the machine and it's very obvious. There's no obvious way. You can take a grammar and check whether the grammar is LRK, but it's a complicated definition. The reason I haven't told you what LRK grammars look like is because I have to define something called the first and then the follow and give you a condition about the first and the follow sets. And it takes a whole lecture just to understand the definitions, and it's not a fast thing to check. You get a whole homework assignment just to get used to it, but you're definitely not an eyeball kind of a thing. But more importantly, if I give you just a grammar, the question is about the grammar. I could give you a stupid grammar, and there might be another LRK grammar that does the same language, even though this grammar I gave you isn't LRK. So the question is just about the grammar, not about the language. Right, but in terms of whether or not you could use a better algorithm, how do you know, given a grammar, whether or not you have to use something that is in? There's, there's a very, very specific way of checking if a grammar is LRK. But it's complicated. It's, it's quite complicated. And, and, and the complication has to do specifically because it, it's got to be something which parses deterministically. So to check whether that's true is, is an involved process, but completely mechanical. And you write a program to do it. That's exactly what Dimitri will do if he gets to it. He'll show you exactly how to determine if a grammar is LRK. And it, you end up, it's very interesting, you end up creating a non-deterministic finite state machine of legal items, and then a deterministic finite state machine of parsing tidbits. It, it, well, it's, it's, it's very neat, but it's complicated. Questions? All right, let's do a little more before we quit, and then we'll quit today. Questions more about this? OK about this? There's really just one more topic to this ring in our bullseye of hierarchy for context-free languages. And it's the discussion of closure properties and decision algorithms for context-free languages. This also gives a nice segue into talking about the next level of the hierarchy, Turing machines. Because Turing machines, one of the main topics we talk about with Turing machines is decidability and the existence of problems that are undecidable problems that are often very, very practical. 
Closure is not just connected with decision algorithms. If things are closed, then you can minimize them, like with finite state machines. You can almost decide anything. So there's a close connection between closure and decision algorithms, but closure also has to do with showing things are not part of your set. If you show something's not a context-free language with a pumping lemma, you might be able to show that something else is not context-free because these operations are closed for context-free languages. So let's quickly review what's closed for context-free languages, what's closed for deterministic context-free languages. I gave you this chart. You can kind of glance at it while we go through this. I won't go through any complicated proofs now. Your brains have done a lot of detail. We'll, we'll stick with the big picture right here. And we'll talk a little bit about closure and decision algorithms. I'll do this in more detail. Uh, we're going to have one more lecture about context-free languages before we go to the next jump up. And we're just going to intro today and talk about a neat problem before we quit. So let's, let's write these down. Is there CFLs. Like Maybe. D, D means decidable, U means undecidable, and uh, T means trivial. T means true. It means it's, it's for sure decidable. It's just the answer is always yes. How is that different than decidable? It's not. You could have just written D, but if you wrote D, somebody would think that you really need a clever algorithm. The algorithm for the T's are the are print line yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so they're trivially decidable. It's like, here, here's a question about finite state machines that, that is trivial. I give you a regular expression, and I ask you, is the language represented by this regular expression regular? And you say, well, yes, it is, and wonder why I would ask you that. that that's a trivial problem. So um, is the complement I give you a language that's, a, that's described by a finite state machine. I ask you, is its complement also regular? What do you say? Yes. You say, yes, that's a trivial decision algorithm. If I give you a context-free gra grammar, and I ask you, is the complement of the language generated by this grammar also context-free? That's a hard question. It might be and it might not be. And let's see if we can find that here. Do, 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 do. Is the complement of the language also a language of the same type? Regular sets? Trivial. Deterministic context-free languages, trivial. Context-free languages, undecidable. What used to be under <laughs> that you scribbled out there? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I heard that one goes from unknown to trivial. Yeah, it, <laughs> there's a little star. This was solved last year, 1990. So we didn't have to bother with the one in the middle. Yeah. So we just went right to trivial. <laughs> That's right. It turns out that the complement of any context-sensitive language is also a context-sensitive language. They're closed under complement. Is that a Turing machine? No, it's a little less than a Turing machine. Okay. It's, it's algorithms that run in order and space. Oh, right. Um, well, so let's review some of these closure properties and decision algorithms. First, these closure properties. Uh, CFLs, are they closed under union? Yes or no? Why? Who can prove that to me with, a, with, a, with an explanation? Don't say because it says so on the sheet. I cross things out on the sheet, right? So how can you trust it? Why are, why are context-free languages closed under union? What? I put them up on top. See the little things I wrote in? It wasn't on the sheet. I don't know why, but... Why do you think they're closed under union? Convince me that if you give me two context-free languages, that I can union them together and get another context-free language. Yep. <laughs> Here's the proof. All right. All right. I guess this proof means you make two E moves from a new start state to the start states of the two machines you're given. All right. I like to do this proof with grammars because it seems more natural with grammars. You don't have to talk about E moves. If somebody gives me two grammars, start symbol S, start symbol T, then I just make a new start symbol, M, and M goes to S, M goes to T, and that generates the union. There's a lot of ways to prove it. It's definitely closed under union. All right, it's not closed under complement. It's not closed under intersection. It is closed under reversal. How do you show the context-free languages are closed under reversal? Yeah. 